good day. This is Russell Hendrickson of Practical Data Solution. Thank you for joining us in your schedule today. So let's jump right into the topic here. And I'm throwing up on the screen here a, uh, a visualization. This is actually a dashboard that we built out in Tableau with some patient access metrics that are blended. This dashboard showing a number of different metrics, the ability to interact with the dashboard, and can even, um, this dashboard can be sliced and diced and uh, shown, drill all the way down or published out. So part of our goals for the webinar is, you know, we've seen these visualizations. Every day the software vendors are coming out with newer tools, companies like Tableau and Click, MicroStrategy, they're coming out with these tools and they're promising us these highly graphical visuals. How do we understand the different types of visual dashboards? How do we understand what's common and what's being used in the healthcare market? What are other organizations doing? What are the pros and cons of staging full interactive visuals that can slice and dice and drill versus just visuals that we can publish out quickly? And how do we understand the resources behind them? And then ultimately, is there a, some kind of a proven approach? And certainly at PDS, we have a recommendation for how to move from wherever you are today or whatever types of dashboards you're publishing today to these kind of visually interactive dashboards, which clearly is where we're headed with the technology and the business needs behind it as we apply them to various topics. So let's dig a little further into what is visualizations um, and the idea is that we're using visual data so we can get the picture, we can analyze it. You know, a picture's worth a thousand words and instead of using sort of traditional numbers and spreadsheets and column reports, we can get, you know, information that quickly shows where the outliers are or where we need to act to improve on our performance. The visualization term really comes from the scientific visualization field where there's interactive visual in interfaces and traditionally was used specifically um, in the science areas. But today with technology and the software getting more powerful and easier to work with, we now have added to what are sort of standard analytics tools, all of the major vendors in the market bringing these visualization tools that are much easier to use and pretty much anybody who has some kind of a background to work with a computer can start publishing out numbers. Um, I found this up on LinkedIn and I sort of enjoyed it because um, the this is from an advertisement from Tableau, but it talks about before I was always looking at numbers and rows and columns, now I'm eager to see analysis, you know, because it tells the story and it shows trends and the power that the data brings because it's visual. Now, maybe that's a little much, you know, but I guess it's certainly more interesting to look at charts and graphs visually, you know. So let's break down visualization a little further. So certainly within the types of visualization tools, we can then talk not just visualization, presenting it graphically and visually, but interactive visualization where we can now take the take it further from just a visualization to technology that can actually slice, drill down, and change as we're working through the data. And that's, you know, sort of the levels that we're talking about. And so within healthcare, certainly based on our experience, the most popular tools by far, uh, Tableau is getting a lot of press lately, and most organizations can tell you, oh, that's some kind of a visual dashboarding tool. Click, right behind Tableau, very, um, very strong in healthcare, leading into organizations. MicroStrategy, um, not always known by name, but they're very prevalent around. Those three um, competing, trying to be the leading of visualization, and they're what are called the three independents. They're not owned by some of the larger software companies, not to be um, you know, put aside, but IBM, Microsoft, SAP Business Objects, certainly the bigger software companies that all have significant leadership in the analytics and business intelligence market and continue to also bring visualization tools out, you know, almost daily is what we're seeing revisions to the tools. So let's talk, before we talk the levels and types of visualization tools, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't discuss what we call analytical intensity. And analytical intensity is really how we can move from summarizing data and trend analysis, kind of common things you might see in a dashboard. But now we can start to move up the chain where we start to get to higher levels of working with analytics and bringing in benchmarks, targets, and adding context to dashboards. Ultimately, then, we bring in relationships where we now start to relate patient access data with patient satisfaction data. We might want to look at expense or we might want to look at denial rates based on how we're registering patients and then the satisfaction with their encounter. So when we start to relate data, 
you know, it requires a higher level of analytical intensity to bring together different data sets coming from different applications. And ultimately what we're really trying to do when we do this is to project where we have performance gaps, where are there opportunities, or what would be the impact if we can improve where we have those gaps to our bottom line. Let's now take that same concept of analytical intensity and talk about it across dashboards. So we have static dashboards, which traditionally might be used, and this is where organizations may have started with Excel or publishing something into Adobe. And then we want to move up to interactive dashboards, the next level, so we can interact in the dashboards, we can see different departments or locations, okay? And so an analytical intensity goes up, and related to that, the resources behind it to build these dashboards, the skills required are at higher levels. Then we can go to the next level, interactive dashboards that can drill, and then interactive dashboards that we can blend data sets across. So let's break those down just one step further, and then we're going to dig into some of our, our content here behind this. So static dashboards, one of the biggest advantages why so many organizations are using static dashboards is they can be implemented very quickly and usually require little, if any, licensing. Okay. The downside is you can't interact with the information. You can't get additional information if you see a problem in the dashboard. Then we move to interactive dashboards. And now interactive dashboards where we see performance gaps, we can start to slice and dice or change data or look at different aspects or, or break things down. We can understand the what and the why. The downside is we need a higher skill level behind the scenes, and it usually takes more time to train users, where before with a static dashboard, anybody can look at a picture. The next level, we talk about interactive drillable dashboards. So with interactive drillable dashboards, now we're really starting to give the user all the information they need. They can see things in the visuals, they can change and answer the what and why, and they do have the ability to drill down into the detail and get all the way down to the root causes. The downside to this is it requires a much higher skill level. We can only bring data marts to the user that we have fully modeled, meaning that we built from the ground up because we can't give the user the ability to drill down unless we built them from the ground up. And then the highest level of visual dashboards we talk about is interactive drillable where we blended multiple data sets. So this really is bringing everything together at every level, giving the user everything they need. The downside is it usually takes a lot more planning behind the scenes. We need different types of resources. We need higher levels of skills in those resources. So with that, um, we're going to do just a quick survey here. I'm going to launch it up on your screen. If you would take a minute to vote in here. And the question is, what percentage of your current dashboards within your organization are predominantly visual? It looks like uh, about a third of the organizations are saying very little that are on the call here. Um, about 50%, 45, 50%, or somewhere between 25 and 75%. And not surprising, just 20% of the organizations are saying much of what they're doing is visual. It, one of the key areas that um, a lot of our clients are really <clears throat> asking us to do a lot with them on because it's really hard to get information out of scheduling systems. They weren't built for that and we all do wacky things with the way we set up templates and the way that we look at a, a data that way. But at the same time, patient access is, is incredibly crucial. If, if we're not doing things right to get patients in the door, it, it causes quality problems, it increases costs, and um, in the, at the end of the day, we're going to lose patients if we don't do things better. So how are we getting out there so that we can better serve uh, our, our patients, and what are the things that we need to be looking at? So here are some of the key measures that we work with our clients on with uh, around the area of, of patient access. Um, we really like to look at session statistics to give us an idea of the capacity that our, our providers really have. And then we also want to look at like lost appointment ratios and no-show rates to see what of that capacity is, is getting wasted, so to speak. In addition to, to these metrics that are out there, we want to look at appointment lags and how long it's taking to get into, into the system from the, the time the appointment's requested. And then we want to look at maybe those no-show rates and, uh, and cancellation rates by the lag categories. How does that drag down when we're scheduling one to seven days out versus 30 days out? So with all of these metrics, the question becomes, how can we visualize these? What are some ways that we can present data to um, management, maybe to our providers themselves, in a way that they don't have to digest a bunch of numbers, but can just get a quick view of what they're looking at? So what you see on the screen right now 
is a static dashboard that can be created at, at say a provider level and it gives them with you know use of, of indicators and colors and categories looking at last month versus the current month versus a six month average and they can see how they're doing and where there are problem areas and so for this particular provider you can see in areas like third next and no show rate while in the current month they're not as high as they are in the other measures from where they are in their six month average where they were in the red in a, an area of great concern it does show a trending improvement so these are ways that these providers can look see that what they're doing is is working and that they can move forward that way if we want to maybe get more of a management perspective we can use a dashboard which we call kind of our quick answers dashboard and this philosophy you can see there's some summary level data up at the top for those who really do want to digest the numbers themselves and really take a look at, at what's going on but there are also the key indicators and then there are answers to some key questions that we highlight where are we doing well where are areas of concern that may need some immediate attention so if you look further you can see that there are graphs and trends that they can see quickly and easily uh, is this trend line going in the direction that I would expect to see are there spikes that need to be addressed um, are there you know areas of concern or things that we need to implement on a more strategic basis that may take longer but will overall improve what we're doing we can look at basic metrics we can look at more advanced metrics we can make uh, you know a couple of pages this way to you know to really dig down but again give a visualized view of what's going on rather than having to digest a bunch of numbers and graphs and charts the, the next dashboard that, that you'll see here is kind of that same uh, interactive web dashboard that Russ showed from, from Tableau. Um, I won't go through that one again, but what I'd like to do is maybe go into another uh, visualized analytics interactive dashboard that's web-based for visual insight. One of the reasons why I really like the interactive dashboards with patient access metrics is because you can see the interplay between the metrics that are out there. You can see how they correlate and how maybe one metric may be driving the other. So this is, again, interactive dashboard and visual insight, which allows us to apply filters very quickly and easily. It allows us to look at multiple content areas and metrics at the same time, um, look at things like appointment statistics, look at appointment statuses, scheduling utilization, we can look at visit type information, appointment lag information. But what we really want to do is look at this area and try to find problems and drill paths. So if we look at, say, third next available, and we highlight just the top four or five providers that are in there, and maybe we can drill down a little bit and see you know, what's going on in these areas that, that we can look at. So we have those providers identified you can see let's take a look why are there providers with lower scheduling utilization even though their third next is so high and we can highlight those individual providers and filters the report a little bit say that a visit type issue doesn't look like it looks like they're just doing return patient visits which is a problem in and of itself but if you look more at the session statistics which are down in the lower left you can see they're really only running one full session a day and maybe two half sessions. So we could probably drag down a couple of those uh, metrics with, uh, you know, opening up some additional sessions that are out there or making the sessions that they are working a, a couple of additional hours uh, with those as well. This is what I talk about when looking at the interplay and looking at, you know, these these basic metrics to get a good story of what's going on and, and help you really see where your focus should be in management to help improve what you're doing. Now once we have a lot of these basic metrics down, um, we do have clients that are doing some more outside of the box thinking, some more advanced metrics where they're looking at clinical cycle time, looking at you know throughput that way, looking at some more granular utilization metrics with how much is the provider actually in the office, what are they doing with double books and frozen durations and, and things like that. Additional things that, that can be looked at are things like how effective are, are our confirmation calls? Um, are those going out and um, how well are we doing with continuity care? How well are we doing with chronic care management? Understanding what we're doing from a basic standpoint allows us to get to these absolutely critical metrics as well. 
but you know, really visualizing and providing that information to people who, instead of having to spend their time digesting a, a dashboard, can just find key areas, key problem spots, and spend their time more effectively in improvement. Looks like the vast majority are either not publishing or are utilizing static dashboards, which is which is great. There, you know, there's there's a lot to offer through the uh, the interactive dashboards in in drilling and uh, and looking at the the correlation between those metrics that are out there. So thank you for answering that. I appreciate it. Excellent, Scott. And thanks so much for covering that topic. We'll come back to you in in just a minute. So our other speaker, Becky Cook. Becky, if I could ask you, can you talk to some of the challenges with visualizing uh, physician compensation and physician compensation reports? Sure, uh, thank you. I think uh, we have some great opportunities in usually using visual tools and visual web tools with physician compensation. Now, it used to be that physician compensation, you used an Excel spreadsheet, you sent the report out to the physicians, probably provided it to them on hand a hand or through an email, and it was relatively simple. All you needed was patient visits, um, some form of productivity, revenues or relative value units, and their compensation calculation. With the changes coming about with value-based contracts and performance-based contracts, we need a lot of additional data. We need to be able to get the calculation of shared savings. We need data from our insurers to calculate our quality incentives, per, man, per member per month care management programs, needing projections of member months and patient retention rates. And we have to find all of these ways, we have to find ways to communicate all of these disparate sources of revenues to our physicians in a way that makes sense to them. So a lot of complex information needs to be blended and put on a single sheet of paper for the physician. We haven't done before. When we hear feedback on physician compensation, it's usually something like, we have so many plans that it's exceptionally difficult and expensive to, make, to administer our plans, or we have analysts, multiple analysts, who do nothing but work physician compensation. The biggest one that concerns me is, is the fact that, or the notion that our physicians don't know how to use the data to improve their practice. So to make sure that they're capturing all of the incentives that are available to them as well as managing their productivity levels to the level that they want. So it's always a problem to get physicians engaged with using dashboards, but it is easier to get them to use dashboards around physician compensation if they are engaging and if they have the uh, means to do something with the data to improve their compensation or simply to manage their work-life balance. In this age of social media, media and interactive websites, designing interact physician compensation reports can be um, a huge step forward with getting physicians to engage with our tool sets. So there's a difference between the types of data that we need. There's the data that we absolutely have to have to calculate the compensation, and then there are incentive metrics that we need. And having them both included on the dashboards is very important. Here's an example of a static dashboard that shows um, three components of a performance plan, compensation plan. It shows their RVU productivity. It shows an individual incentive goals based on quality and patient satisfaction. And then clinic goals that the physicians have to earn together. This combination of both individual and clinic-based goals needs to be represented on their dashboard. You can see across the X's or um, indicators that mark which level of RVUs the physician is earning. There are green and red check marks and X's showing which incentive results earned. And down below in the lower left-hand corner, you can see the calculation of compensation and projected where year-end compensation would be. There's a graph that shows the trend of their work RVU production or whatever metric you use. And then in the lower right-hand corner is a graphic showing what portion of the incentive plans the physician has earned in blue, and in orange, the portion of incentive plans that's still available. So it's important that we show the physicians what's available and how to get there in some of these dashboards. 
And then below the pie graph is a summary of what they've actually earned in dollars and percents. So it can be important to include the numeric numbers on these visual dashboards to provide context. And it's perfectly appropriate. I'd like to look at the same information in a web-based visualization. This one is done with MicroStrategy through our Empower tool. And you can see that the data is the same. In the upper left-hand corner is the summary of our physician compensation calculations. In the middle at the top is the work RVU production. And on the right is a pie graph of our incentive plans. So we're looking here at um, physician Todd Allen. Let's look at a different physician and see how quickly we can change our perspective. And we're going to look at another physician. You can see there the difference in the work RVU trend production and in the pie graph where we're showing that the physician actually has about 50% of the incentive compensation still available to them. We can look in the lower left-hand corner and see that their work RVU compensation tier is consistently at level three. So there's no problem with the, this position's production, but we need to help them figure out what's going on with the other metrics that are included in their incentive plan. Now we can look at all of the physicians you saw in that drop-down box that all of the physicians were there. But as a manager and a financial person, I would want to look at this data for all of our physicians combined and then by division. So this is a, a, an interactive dashboard that rolls up the data from the individual physicians and shows us what's happening on a macro level. So you can see in the middle section that there are graphs for each of the divisions included in this group, internal medicine, family practice, cardiology, etc. To the uh, visualization to the right of that, we can see how many physicians are earning at the different levels of RVUs. You can see there that there's a large number earning at level four, and thankfully a smaller portion of physicians that are earning compensation at level one. In the lower left-hand corner, there are a series of three indicators on the visualization. The green means that they are meeting all of the incentive metrics. The orange indicates that they are meeting one, at least one, of the incentive metrics. And if they have a red dot, they are not meeting any of the incentive metrics. Now, this makes sense in macro, but I'd like to look at it at a division level. So, Russ, if you could select internal medicine for me. We're going to look at what the internal, physician, internal medicine physicians are specifically doing. And I can see that I've got a, no, a few physicians there in the lower right-hand corner that are at lower levels of productivity. And I have one physician who is not earning the incentives. So we're going to look at those four physicians that are, or those fewer physicians that are at lower levels of productivity. And what we can see is looking to the left, they're mostly earning their incentives. We have two who are not. And earning at higher levels of productivity. So as we drill down and look at those two physicians who are missing their incentive metrics, we can actually see which metrics they're losing. We can look at the table at the top. We like to look at tables, and you can see which of those individual metrics or combinations they are um, have set as fail. And again, here we've used red and green to distinguish between pass and fail to make it easier for the physician to quickly, or for the, the administrator to quickly look at these metrics. You can see that we have uh, gone back to our original graph and we went to look. We're looking at all of the physicians or a, a sampling of the physicians who are not meeting any of the metrics. Again, we want to be able to direct our administrators and the physicians to those problem areas. You can see how quickly we can identify them and drill down into the physician specifics of what's, what's our opportunity for improving physician compensation. Excellent. Well, thank, thank you, you Becky. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, nicely done. So, um, you know, there's an example of a, a full visually interactive dashboard. That dashboard does have full drill down behind it, so it's built up. 
to, so we could slice and dice and we could actually drill into any of those areas and look at more detail behind performance if we wanted to look at a physician's RVUs and see where they're performing or where they're, they're scheduled to work and they're not working. All of that's behind the scenes with a fully interactive dashboard. So um, in the interest of trying to cover all the topics here, I'm going to ask Scott to come back here and talk about denials and some of the challenges that managing the back end of the revenue cycle bring with visualizing and dashboarding. Scott? Thanks, Russ. You know, I've, I've been in healthcare about 20 years, and there's, there's never been a period of time in which uh, denials wasn't something that was frustrating those people who manage revenue cycle. And when you look at denials, a lot of the frustration comes from it being difficult to get measures out not necessarily knowing what to look at, and people feeling a lot of uh, that they don't have a lot of control over what they can do um, around the areas of denial. So, if we can talk just a little bit about some of the key measures that um, that you can look at and and the best strategies, there are really two ways to look at denials. One is there are short-term, urgent situations, things that you need to know at the end of every single month so that you can nip problems in the bud and keep them from becoming huge problems later on. Uh, the second issue are more longer-term strategic initiatives that you can put in place and try to see um, improvement in trends uh, over time to, to look at that. So let's look at the short-term urgent situation, kind of the first things first. What do we need to know right away? And I would say people managing denials or managing revenue cycle need to know every month how much is being denied, who is doing it, why are they doing it. But most of all, what you want to know is, is this out of the ordinary? Denials can be just kind of a function of volumes in and of itself. But what we want to look for is to apply some benchmarks, some internal benchmarks, benchmarking time periods, benchmarking payers against each other, um, and looking for spikes, looking for abnormal activity and determining is it because of a payer, is it because of a, a department or a location internally, or, or is it a denial code that's causing us problems this month? Is it a one-time thing, or is it something that can grow if we don't move forward with it? So what, what we do is we want to create some visualizations to show this so that we can get a quick view of what's going on, find out where and if we need to focus our efforts, and, uh, and, and be able to move on with what we're trying to do. So you can see this dashboard right here. If you look in the middle right there, it shows very quickly right away our denial rate. Our denial rate is higher than our target denial rate. It has a, it's in red, it has an X. They know this immediately upon looking at it. Uh, from here, they can also look then and see, okay, where are our spikes? And you can see in the green right above that there was a spike in registration denials for the month, and that's something that probably needs to be addressed with the, the clinic locations and uh, capturing uh, appropriate information from the patient. One of the reasons we also want to do this is we want to look at kind of the urgency and how it's impacting our bottom line. And so if you look at the lower right-hand side, you can see a payment rate comparison where our denied claims are only getting paid at about 10.5% where we're getting about 54% for clean claims. So there's a big issue with the, the claims that are getting denied and things that we need to make sure that we're taking quick, quick in order to improve that, that bottom line. Well, again, we can take kind of a quick answers approach with denials. And one of the things I really like about denials data is that it lends itself to drillability, or we want to take in and, and we want to get more information. So we can take this quick answers dashboard that's right here. Again, we have the same summary information. We have the same answers and indicators of where are we not performing well. You can see right here we have an issue with denial lag. Denial lag is the difference between the date the invoice is created and the date we get the denial posted back. And we can see from looking at a trend that, yeah, the, the, the denial lag indicated by the first one have an upward trend over the past couple of months. So what we want to do is we want to go in and analyze the feature that's in there where we can drill directly into the analytical system or the business intelligence system. This allows us to apply filters or we can do some nesting of information so that we can look at more information all at one time on the screen. We can then go in and, and take if we need more slice and dice we can, or we can drill directly into the detail. And a lot of times denial work requires us getting clear down to individual invoices, patient level detail that we 
process and see what went on during the month and if there are things that we need to uh, submit back to the payers. We have all of this detail in front of us that, that we know what we need to work with. So that's kind of an example of a static dashboard but with drillable features that provide that information. And you can look again at the you know simpler metrics or you can look at more advanced metrics that come along. So let's talk about some of the advanced metrics that are more strategic. Um, some of the things that, that we look at are matched denial metrics where we want to get our denial rates and match them back to the charges that generated them rather than looking at a, a strict post period basis. It allows us to to get more of a little bit more accurate in looking at those and then we can also once we're matched we can then look at transaction metrics that occur after what's getting paid, what's getting written off, what's still sitting out there in accounts receivable with no transactional activity three, six months after the uh, after the original charge was posted. If we want to go even a little bit further, let's look at lags and the impact on the cash flow that that's having and is there a way that we can speed up the collections on the side, whether it's from submitting the claims to the payers and getting the denials back or whether it's on our side with how long it's taking it to appeal to get those uh, first payment lags and then follow up with the zero balance collections as well. There's a lot of information with, with denials that's out there and, uh, and visualizing really can help people manage and put strategic processes in place. So Scott, and I, I appreciate it. I just want to reemphasize this point. Visual dashboards when we're looking at things like denials, um, not having that drillability behind it is just re it's really critical because in most cases, in order to really get to the root cause, you've got to get all the way down to the claims and the denials to understand where our, where our causes are. So you know, providing a visual dashboard without that drillability, not, not quite as meaningful. Um, users are going to be asking for more information, and if you can't provide that backup, and we'll talk about why shortcutting to these visual dashboards may not always be a good idea coming up. The other thing I want to stress is uh, at PDS here we have we, we've done webinars in the past talking about denials. We have many different visualizations of denials data. If you're interested in learning more, please uh, you know, reach out to us, um, and we'll be happy to, to dig into that topic deeper. Okay. We have one more content area I want to discuss, um, and Becky had asked you to um, come back and talk to us about the challenges with visualizing HCC and patient risk scores before we tie all these uh, topics together and talk about the tools again. So Becky? Certainly. So HCC risk scoring is an, a new area of financial management for most physicians when at hospitals have been doing this some time with their case mix adjustments. But what we're finding is that with all of the implementation of performance-based contracts, managing HCC scores is going to be very important. Of all the areas that we're working with at PDS, HCC scoring, risk acuity scoring, is probably the most focused on predictions and future events, using our data to predict where are we going to be this year and next. So one of the things that we're seeing with these performance-based contracts is that almost everyone is risk adjusting them anymore. Even the commercial insurance companies who are looking at fee-for-service fee schedules are using the risk adjustment factors to determine whether you're an effective payer, uh, an effective uh, provider for them or not. So they are tying fee schedule increases and incentives to the risk level of your patients. Hence the need for management of understanding your scores and being able to manage them. Let's look at a static dashboard, visual dashboard here that has the metrics on it for a typical performance-based contract. This contract has 10 different metrics on it. You can see them listed under the quick answers on the left-hand side with a green and red indicator of where we are at this point for those particular metrics. Then the graphs represent individual or multiple similar metrics and where we are with accomplishing those. So this dashboard is based in the month of November. So uh, we would typically have just one more month left in order to meet these metrics. You can see where we are there with hypertension. You can see the office visit trend line there in the blue bar graph. And up above is an important feature. In that 
graph in that table of uh, numbers, the middle column there is the number of patients that we need to see yet before year end to meet our goal of seeing all of our patients for a wellness visit during the year. Most of the metrics on this page are supplemented in context. You can see them graphically, but you can also see them in numbers and with color indicators to make it easy to understand what's happening with this contract. So with implementation of MACRA this year, I think these types of dashboards are particularly important to understanding how we're going to be paid in future years. So starting in 2019, where we're going to, um, as we're told, have 30% of our payments based on quality and 30% based on cost mechanisms, we're going to need to manage those just as actively as we have managed coding or scheduling in the past. Being able to manage the data and see what the data is representing for us is very important. And we talked earlier about physician engagement around physician compensation. It's going to be every bit as necessary to engage our physicians in our quality and our risk scoring efforts. That data all flows originally from the physicians. So we need to make sure that they are engaged by providing that information to them on a dashboard. And we have an example here of a very static dashboard that could be shared with physicians and showing them the up and down indicators in green and red, um, highlighting the cell that is the most important on the dashboard, and that is based on the number of patients they had in 2015 with HCC scores, how far are they through seeing all of those patients and scoring them for this year. You can see as of year-to-date September, um, Dr. Todd Allen has scored about 80% of his patients so far. So he has a ways to go, and we've got about three months or two and a half months left in the year to get all of those patients scheduled. So I hope you can see how this can be used not only for information but also as tools to help you manage how are we going to work smarter for the remainder of the year and next year and using this information to predict what our revenue sources are going to be and how our acuity level impacts our revenue sources for future years. Thanks, Russ. Great, Becky. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we could certainly show and talk more about population risk acuity, HCC scoring, and how to put this together for both you know, financial and operational measuring risks. Um, this is going to be the topic of our next webinar coming up uh, March 8th. If you'd like to learn more, it will be the whole webinar will be focused around this topic. Becky will take us through how to use risk scores, how to manage, and we'll be showing that in context with analytics and dashboards and how to communicate so we can better track our performance. So look for that coming up, and we'll have that information out uh, probably in the next two weeks so you can register for that if you're interested. So let's try to tie all this together because Scott and Becky have shared some of the challenges. We've looked at some different metrics. We've looked at different types of dashboards. What do we really need? What does your organization need? Do we need you know, static dashboards? Do we need to be able to interact with dashboards? Do we need drillable interactive dashboards? And how do we get there? And I'd love to say there's one answer, but, but really comes back to your organization, the challenges within your organization, and where does your organization want to be? I'm a big fan of thinking about strategy. What's your strategy and where do you want to go? I think everybody agrees this is where we want to be. The question is how do we use the resources we have today to build and move us in that direction? This is a common thing I hear organization after organization. We need to get there today. We want interactive or we want visual dashboards today, and it's what I call shortcutting. You can shortcut to get to interactive visual dashboards. Tableau, click, MicroStrategy, just to name a few. You can go online right now. You can download in about 20 minutes their tool in a, in a free trial version that is fully working, and you can start shortcutting by loading in metrics and building out visual dashboards. The upside to that is you can immediately take advantage of this technology. The downside is you can't drill because it's not sitting on top of your analytics, right? And then the other side is to try to communicate or publish out that data, you're typically back to having publishing a PDF or a static dashboard because they want licensing and significant licensing if you suddenly want to publish that information out for a few hundred providers beyond a static dashboard. So you can start work working with this technology today, but you may not be able to have it all. 
Some of the common mistakes we see with organizations when it comes to dashboarding and visualization is they start by picking the tool first. We've decided to pick a tool. We don't have any experience, but that's the tool we're going to buy. We're not sure what we want to publish, but if we have the tool, you know, the, the answers will come. And then oftentimes it's let's take the metrics we can't get to, we don't have, we've never published or staged or gotten validation on, and that's what we're going to try to build out into this tool that we have very little experience with. And I've seen this many times. We as an organization run into this time and time again. Well, we tried something and it didn't work, so the tool's no good. No, the tools are very powerful. The, really, the key, though, is we have to have a good plan. If we can't put it down on paper, if we don't have a prototype, if we haven't actually used the data we have, put it in front of physicians and administrators and made sure we've got the right metrics, with clear definitions measured the right way. How are we going to translate that if, we haven't, if we're not able to do that? How are we going to translate that to one of these visual applications where we want to do full slice and dice and drillable? So your strategy really needs to be, where are we today? And where do we want to get to? And at what time frame? Should we consider doing a pilot, licensing just a piece of technology or a small pilot? A lot of these organizations, the, the visualization software tools, will do you know, pilots or discounted or trial versions that you could extend out. Do you have staff? Do you have budget? Do you have experience? Should you consider using a company like PDS that has done this many times over the years or some other outside resources? We're a big fan of walk and then run, fly. And that's why it's practical data solutions, trying to bring practical approaches to implementing technology. If you're not familiar with PDS, we help organizations get answers. What we're talking about today, visualize, dashboard, uh, and make it presentable, and helping organizations distribute information. We also have um, core competencies that are uh, at PDS here focused around today's topic are include, you know, PDS is a healthcare analytics company. We're solely focused on working with healthcare data and working with healthcare organizations. Uh, we have tremendous experience in staging and data modeling, which is really what's needed to make dashboards drillable and to bring all your KPIs to join and blend, which includes blending different data sources and making sure that all the pieces of the puzzle come together, as well as designing dashboards, visualization, and adding context. And finally, as I was just talking about, is having a strategy and helping you with the strategy, which can include budgeting, resources, and planning for what, do we, what can we do today, what can we do next year, but where do we want our organization to be with both technology and information in the next two, three years, you know, looking at long.